Welcome to the Coin Stories podcast, where we talk about investing, hard money, Bitcoin, and how technology is revolutionizing the global economy. I'm Natalie Brunel, and I'm here to learn with you. So this is for educational and entertainment purposes only. None of the discussions should constitute as official investment advice, and you should always do your own research. Make sure you're subscribed to my page so you don't miss out on any new content. This show is made possible through partnerships with companies I trust, and I'm very picky about who I partner with. So I hope you take the time to listen to the ad reads throughout the show. First up, Swan. I partnered with Swan because it is a Bitcoin-only company that is focused on helping people save for their future and self-custody their Bitcoin. Swan can help you start a direct deposit to take advantage of Bitcoin as a savings technology and learn how to take it off the exchange. Swan's mission is to educate 10 million future Bitcoiners through free resources and media projects like the Hard Money Show. Swan also offers retirement planning with an IRA, tax loss harvesting, and a white glove private client service. I use Swan to dollar cost average, and I deposit a little bit every day that's equivalent to what I might spend on a meal so that I add to my future nest egg and lower my yearly cost basis. Swan Studios produces my hard money news reports, simplifying Bitcoin for mass audiences and documenting Bitcoin adoption around the world. To learn more and get $10 in free Bitcoin, head to swanbitcoin.com slash Natalie Brunel. All right, next up, Bitcoin Conference 2024, the world's largest Bitcoin event is headed to Nashville next year. Early bird tickets are now available, and this is the lowest cost you'll be able to secure for the conference all year. And if you use the code HODL, H-O-D-L, you'll get an extra 10% off. So come join us for three great days of networking events, panels, keynotes, workshops, and more. You never know what big name might be announced when tickets are much, much higher in price. Head to b.tc slash conference and use the code HODL. And before Bitcoin 2024, the next conference I'm headed to is BitBlock Boom this August in Austin, Texas, where I'm really looking forward to speaking alongside Preston Pish, Mark Moss, and other great voices in the space. You can get your tickets at bitblockboom.com and use code HODL for 10 percent off. I'll see you there. All right, it's time for the show. Hello, everyone. I am so honored to be joined once again by Colonel Douglas McGregor, a decorated combat veteran, PhD, and author, and a military expert who we are so grateful to hear from, especially given what happened over the weekend. Uh, Colonel McGregor, thank you so much for joining me. First of all, I just want to hear, what is your take on the crazy weekend and the supposed coup in Russia? Well, I think the word crazy is a a good adjective to attach to this particular event. You know, very few of us in the West understand Russia or Russians. And as a result, we reach all sorts of erroneous conclusions about what is or is not happening. This is one of those events that I'm afraid has to be viewed through a different lens. Prigozhin is an individual, as you know, that is very flamboyant, very outspoken. Uh, He's had lots of opportunities to say good things. He's also said some stupid things. And he's been viewed widely inside the senior ranks of the Russian army as uh, a double-edged sword. Uh, Obviously, Wagner has done a brilliant job. And Wagner is viewed inside Russia in much the same way that the French Foreign Legion is viewed inside France. Uh, Wagner is not seen as a mercenary organization at all. Certainly, they have foreigners in their ranks. And yes, they have convicted criminals that uh, on certain conditions were allowed to serve. But on the whole, they're seen as fiercely loyal to the Russian state, and they are. And just like the French Foreign Legion, they fight extremely well. And no one in France will ever criticize the French Foreign Legion. And I think you have a similar situation in Russia right now. The Wagner Group is extraordinarily popular. So is Prigozhin. Lots of Russians look to him for inspiration. He is seen as someone who wants to wage Uh, unrelenting war with the Ukrainian state. He wants this man Zelensky gone. He and his fighters are seen as part of this determined Russian effort to destroy this enemy force in Ukraine. So everything that happens has to be understood against that backdrop. Secondly, Prigozhin of late has had some serious problems with the Russian high command. Uh, There are legal issues involved with the Wagner Group. Originally, it was designed exclusively for use overseas, and obviously it's being used domestically. And over time, the military has expressed an interest, I'm talking about the very senior ranks, particularly the Minister of Defense and the Chief of Staff, in breaking this Wagner organization up, which is something that uh, Mr. Prigozhin didn't want to do. 
Secondly, Prigozhin has been, I think, unreasonably hostile on occasion towards the high command. On the other hand, some of his criticism is widely shared inside Russia. Criticism is that he's not only not been adequately supplied, which is open to debate, but also that uh, this war is not being prosecuted with the level of ferocity that it deserves. He doesn't even like the use of the words uh, special military operation. He wants a declared war. He wants the nation mobilized. Now, Putin knows him, and they've known each other for some time. I'm reluctant to use the word, quote unquote, coup, because I don't think Prigozhin ever set out to displace Putin. I think he was trying to get Putin's attention. I think he went too far. And you had uh, the potential for real bloodshed with this small force of three or 4,000 that was going to Moscow. But I think the hope was that he could somehow or another reach Putin's ears, get him to understand that his senior leaders are not what they should be. Whether or not that's true, that's a different issue. But I think that was Prigozhin's principal goal. I don't think he saw himself as rising to the top to replace Putin at all. So I think a lot of the Wagner troops that went with him said, what we're doing is we're going to rescue this man Putin from his generals. We're going to get him to understand what's really happening. Now, there are others that will dispute that. I think Mercurius and his friends, who do a wonderful job, by the way, of reporting, don't share that. But my sources see things differently, and, and so do I. Now, it's all over, <clears throat> and, and there are a couple of things that are very important to understand. Putin is not Stalin. Uh, Russia is not the Soviet Union. If anything, Putin is much closer to a czar than he is to anything else. And he had the opportunity to arrest Prigozhin and the rest of these troops and execute them. And he very quickly decided not to do so. First of all, because of the reasons I cited at the outset, he realizes these men are Russian patriots. They have fought very, very hard for Russia. Secondly, uh, he, he's not really threatened because he had 30,000 troops in Moscow. He's got control. Nobody joined this. No one was interested in supporting this. So he's not really threatened. And Lukashenko has known Prigozhin for at least 20 years. All three men know each other. I think Lukashenko said, look, it's, let me pick this man up, bring him to Belarusia. We'll keep him under wraps. And uh, Putin decided that he could be uh, lenient. I don't think this reflects his weakness. I think it speaks a lot to his strength. So this is now over. <clears throat> the real question is, was the message received? Does Putin understand that he really does need to shake up the high command? Does he now understand that the Russian people want an end to this war? Does he understand that the Russian military, its army sitting in Ukraine, wants to attack and end this thing? There's something else lurking in the background that your viewers need to keep in mind that I think was also on Prigozhin's mind, though I can't prove it. Zelensky has talked of late several times about attacking the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. That's a very dangerous thing because it could conceivably radiate and cause terrible destruction thanks to the radiation if the, one of those reactors was destroyed. Zelensky has been pushing it. Budanov, who works for him and runs the... Uh, intelligence side of the house in Ukraine, has been actively advocating for it. All the time, almost from the very beginning, there has been a concern in Moscow about the potential for a quote-unquote dirty bomb, and that this dirty bomb implemented by the Ukrainians, obviously with this nuclear power plant, could be then presented as a false flag, because ultimately People in, in Washington, uh, the president, people like Graham and Blumenthal who just sponsored this legislation, which would trigger an automatic war with Russia uh, under such circumstances. I, I think they, there's a fear that this is quite real. And once again, that the longer they wait to act decisively, the more likely something like this is to happen. And then you really do have a wider war, which no one in their right mind wants right now. So I, I think all of these things were whirling around in uh, Prigozhin's head. I think they were on the minds of several senior military officers. So now he's gone. He'll go to Belarusia. Some of these soldiers will simply be released. They won't go back to fight, but the majority of the Wagner group will. How they will be employed, where they will be employed, I don't know. But they're too good to dismiss, let's, let's face it. So it's over. Let's see if there's a shakeup in the high command. Let's see how long it takes to unleash this offensive.
What do you think about the mainstream news coverage of this series of events? And why has the war dragged out like this? I think two reasons. First of all, from the very beginning, President Putin was very reluctant to confront the West militarily. He still is. And I think he went into Ukraine with unrealistic expectations, the wrong assumptions. He thought, well, you know, if I go in, I show I'm serious, but I don't do too much, then the West will negotiate. Well, it took several months for him to figure out no one is not going to negotiate. If anything, they viewed what he did as evidence for weakness. So he had to essentially call a timeout, reorganize, reorient. And he listened to the senior leadership that said, we don't have enough troops to do what we need to do. So now you have almost 750,000 troops involved. And there are talks behind the scenes about continuing the mobilization and adding another three or 400,000 men. Because increasingly, Putin is concluding he's not going to find anyone to talk to. And he will ultimately have to march to the Polish border, which is not what he wants to do. He's well aware that the real Ukrainians who live west of the river want nothing to do with Russians. He's not a fool. So I think what he'll do now is take the rest of eastern Ukraine, then he'll move down to Odessa, then there will be another pause. And I think he's watching us. I mean, you talk about the United States. Someone told me this morning that since we changed the debt ceiling, we've added $700 billion in debt to our already staggering size of our debt. Trillions of dollars. I mean, this is crazy. I think he looks at that and says, how much longer can this go on? He sees Donald Trump. He sees JFK, or excuse me, RFK Jr. They are forcefully opposed to war with Russia, as they should be. He looks at Germany, which is now in free fall into a terrible economic recession that could easily become a depression. He sees their scientific industrial base collapsing, and he says, how much longer can this man Schultz last? I don't know what the story is in, uh, with Macron, but I don't see him as a particularly strong figure domestically in France. And then, of course, we have London with Sunak, who's turned out to be pretty much like his predecessors. And I'm not sure the British people really want to go to war with Russia. So you put it all together. And I think he says, I'm going to press ahead, but I'm going to do so deliberately. I'm not going to just say, all right, tomorrow morning, we're marching on, you know, Lvov, and we'll be on the Polish border in 10 days. That's not his style. He's going to do what I said. And then I think, look for a pause and look for some sanity in Europe, because the Europeans are the only ones that can step in. This government that we have is divorced from reality on every level, economically, financially, politically, culturally, strategically, militarily. I want to talk a little bit more about our country's economics, and I'm glad you brought up the debt. Um, turning to this sort of global financial system that appears to be crumbling, do you see our national debt as a national security threat? Oh, absolutely. There's no question about that. And this is what's really disturbing most of all. If you recognize that it's only a matter of time until your own financial system falls apart here at home, and potentially that we slide into a very serious recession, if not a deep depression, which is by no means uh, out of bounds right now for us, you understand that one of the things that you've got to do if you're going to get your creditors to cooperate with you is demonstrate your willingness to tighten the purse strings, to cut spending, to cut back. What is this administration doing? It's almost as though you're on a roller coaster. It's no longer connected to the track. You're about to go over a giant hump and nothing is going to save you. So you, you, you've got to go back to basics and understand, you know, Franklin Roosevelt in 32 and again in 34 effectively defaulted. What he did is he said, I've got to restructure the debt. Well, at the time, we had huge quantities of gold pouring into us from the Europeans who owed us from World War I. That helped a great deal. Secondly, he had a big scientific industrial base that simply needed to be restarted. We need to get people back into it to work. But he also cut spending in a number of important ways, not the least of which was in defense. And he understood that you had to do that to get your creditors to support you. Why would anybody turn to us and say, all right, why would Saudi Arabia, Japan, China, any number of our creditors say, well, you know, these Americans aren't so bad. They're really serious. They want to deal with the debt. There's no evidence for it. 
It's time for a quick break to hear these messages from my partners. Fold is the best Bitcoin rewards debit card and shopping app in the world. You can earn Bitcoin on everything you purchase from Amazon to groceries to your Bitcoin conference tickets with Fold's Bitcoin cashback debit card. And you can win free Satoshis every day or even play for a whole Bitcoin by spinning the rewards wheel. You can also buy Bitcoin and stack sats directly on Fold and earn even more incentives and rewards. This is a great app to get someone totally new into Bitcoin and way better than earning airline miles or hotel points. Head to foldapp.com slash Natalie. And if you use my link, you'll get up to 10,000 sats when you sign up for Spin or Spin Plus and spend at least $20 on the card. I'm so excited to share that I have partnered with CoinKite and we are committed to making sure everyone has the information they need to safely self-custody their Bitcoin. CoinKite produces the cold card wallet, which is the cold storage device I am switching to for safekeeping my Bitcoin. It is Bitcoin only. You can verify the source code. It's ultra secure. And as I'm learning, it's easy to use even if you're a beginner. If you head to their site in my show notes, you can find all of their products from cold cards in different colors to seed plates, tap signers, sats cards, block clocks, which I have behind me, and more. I'm also in the process of creating some how-to videos on cold card. So watch out for those in the near future. Become your own bank with Bitcoin and CoinKite. All right, back to the show. What is your take on the implications of the U.S. going from the world's largest creditor nation to the world's largest debtor nation and the fact that we've been able to sort of exploit our advantage by being the global reserve currency and we're seeing nations start to de-dollarize faster and faster? Well, as you know, the, the nations, the BRICS, I think there's a total of 84 right now interested in working with uh, Russia, China and India to effectively get out from underneath our financial system. Remember the problem with our financial system, it's not the dollar per se, it's our desire to bully everyone. You know, we have 34 nations, last time I looked, under some form of financial sanction. Well, this is crazy. How can you expect to do business when you're telling people, no, we're punishing you for these political reasons. We don't like your human rights record. We don't like this or that. More important, perhaps you're not growing the right crop or the crop we want you to grow. All of this is outrageous nonsense. People have had it. It's over. They put up with this for the first 50 years after the Second World War for obvious reasons. They did not want to be dominated by communism. They saw the danger that it represented to themselves. So this is over. It, it, that no longer justifies this unquestioning obedience. Only the Europeans are following us slavishly. And I think that's because the globalist elite doesn't know what else to do. And remember, what's no one in Washington want to admit? I was wrong. No one will step forward and say, gosh, we made a mistake. So it's all going to collapse, Natalie. It's going to fall apart. It will disintegrate. Somebody asked me yesterday, how, how far do you think we're going to get? Uh, are we going to change things with the next election? I don't know if we'll make it that far. It's hard for me to believe that this man Biden is going to make it through the rest of the year. Uh, he's obviously a cardboard cutout. Other people are handing him the script to read, but he's at, he's at the end of his tether. So what do you do, put Kamala Harris in? Well, good luck with that proposition. I don't know of anybody that believes that woman knows what she's doing. So then suddenly you have a power vacuum. Uh, I think it's going to take something like this before finally someone says, well, what do you do right away that's going to improve our position financially? You cut defense spending because you're dismantling the empire. You've got to dismantle the empire. That's what the Romans did when they fell apart. As you move from Diocletian to the end, bring the troops back, bring them back from England, bring them back from Gaul, bring them back from North Africa until finally they were home and everything changed. So I think something like that is going to happen here. Colonel, something that's always amazed me is how far we're able to kick the can down the road. Um, you know, the U.S. dollar is still used in about 80 percent of global transactions. We're so deeply entrenched in, in this financial system that we helped prop up. And now it's basically built on a foundation of debt. So you mentioned that you think it's going to crumble pretty soon. But how do you actually see it playing out? Because I think a lot of people would argue that it's it's probably going to be the U.S. dollar dominating for a bit longer as other currencies start to rise, including many of us believe Bitcoin. Well, remember that <clears throat> the BRICS and these other 84 countries that want to join them, effectively moving towards a gold-backed currency of some kind or a basket of currencies. I don't know what they'll come up with. 
it takes time to build the institutions like ours. Now, we can argue that the SWIFT system is anachronistic, needs to be overhauled and changed. I, I agree. But you don't build something like that overnight. And confidence in these countries and the ability to do business with them legitimately, that also has to grow. So the dollar is going to persist a bit longer. But as the dollar ceases to be the one and best alternative, that's when Bitcoin steps in. Because again, what's the problem with the dollar right now? The banks. People don't want to be under the thumb of the banks because the banks are controlled by the same globalist elite that runs the media, that gives you the news that isn't news, that creates false narratives, that dominates your government, etc. These are the same people that shipped all of our jobs overseas and deindustrialized America. These are the people that Donald Trump was opposed to and fights against. These are the people that RFK Jr. talks about. That's why Bitcoin is inevitable in my judgment. When, how, and how much, that, that's beyond my level of expertise, but I see that it is inevitable. What else, you, what else can you do? Do you want to use whatever comes out of the BRICS, China, Russia, and India? Probably not immediately. Well, right, exactly. I mean, you mentioned even if it's a basket of currencies backed by gold, how do you audit the gold? Uh, all the gold has been centralized in the vaults of central banks. None of these nations trust one another. And with Bitcoin, it's this immutable trust network and 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 something that anyone can verify from anywhere. So I think that it'll be interesting to see this play out. But I'm kind of curious, you know, you have so much experience deep within the military. Sometimes on this show, we talk about the military industrial complex and and how that has eroded some of the, the economic value you that that the U.S. offers. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about the America that you grew up in? Can you describe it versus the America that you see today that kids are growing up in? I grew up in a <clears throat> fairly modest uh, neighborhood, uh, lower middle class neighborhood, frankly, mostly working class people in North Philadelphia. Most of our neighbors at the time were Ukrainians, Poles, uh, some Lithuanians, a few Irish and Italians thrown into the mix, but these people were either first or second generation Americans. By the way, they were ferociously patriotic, but it was a neighborhood in which you didn't have to lock your doors. Uh, if you did something wrong when I was 10 years old or something, the phone would ring off the hook and people would call my mother. <laughs> you know, this was an America that I think you can see in some of the films uh, of the era, but that's vanished. It's so tragic because you didn't have to worry about being assaulted in the middle of the night. Even in the 1950s, early 60s, you could walk from one end of Philadelphia to the other with about an 80 to 90 percent chance of doing so without being mugged or killed. Well, that, that's impossible. The neighborhood I grew up in is a war zone. It's a tragedy. I go back there and it brings tears to my eyes because the, even though these were modest places, people loved their homes. They took care of things. The place was clean. Everything was well policed. It's all gone. It, it's vanished. How do you get it back? And I think that brings us to some hard questions. You're not going to get there by throwing money at the people that are harming your country, by throwing money at, at people on the grounds that they're uh, oppressed minorities in this kind of business. You've got to You've got to step back and say, first of all, are you an American? You are or you are not. There's no halfway house. What do Americans stand for? They believe in the rule of law, first and foremost. They believe in a meritocracy. We always know that nothing is a perfect meritocracy, but we strive for that goal. That's one of the fundamentals of being an American. We also believe in defending our country, but we're not very excited about traveling all over the world to isolated places where we have no real strategic interest. We don't understand the people. I mean, this is the thing that I encounter all the time. I do not perfectly understand the Russians, but I damn well know that the Russians and we are very different. And we have to understand that. Instead of feeling contempt for people who are different from us, it's time to say, look, we can respect other people's cultures, other, way, other people's ways of doing business. One of our cardinal principles until Woodrow Wilson came along, and I guess you could blame some of this on Teddy Roosevelt, was that we don't interfere in the internal affairs of other countries. We've got to get back to that. We have to build prosperity here at home. Stop talking about other people's 
<clears throat> human rights records. Let's restore the law here. Let's make it safe to walk around Chicago again. You know, this, this is nonsense. And that may take the application of police and potentially military power in some form at some point. But it's got to happen. And I think Americans are coming around to understand that. When and why do you think we lost some of that work ethic that really did make America great? I mean, this country was founded on the ideals of self-determination and freedom. And people were they had pride in in pulling themselves up by their bootstraps and working really hard to determine their destiny. They would have been ashamed to take some of the handouts that people just feel entitled to today. How did we get there? Somebody said uh, <clears throat> something given has no value. In other words, if you don't earn it, it's not meaningful. My generation, we are the so-called boomers. We walked into paradise. We lived in a very different environment for most people, especially true for the children, I would argue, of the 60s. They came into a very different setting from the rest of us. They did not raise their children with the same set of values and attitudes that their parents did, simply because life was too good. It was too easy. All you have to do is look at these outrageous loans to students uh, for what people are incre increasingly questioning uh, is valuable, and that is this four-year college education. What good is a four-year college education if you can't get a job? We didn't used to send everybody to college. We thought all work had dignity. Just because someone was an electrician or a plumber didn't mean they were less than someone who was an attorney. On the contrary, if you thought that way, you were in trouble in the America I grew up in. You treated everyone with respect. Uh, that's gone away. We have too many people now who are what I call white collar frauds. They have nothing to offer. They can't get a real job or they're employed in, in ridiculous jobs. And look at the size of our government. How many of the people that we have in the federal bureaucracy do we really need there? Uh, I don't think a lot of them are really required. In the meantime, we have open borders. Millions of people we can't vet are coming in. They're coming in with questionable credentials. In other words, we're not exactly inviting large numbers of people with degrees in, in practical mathematics, science, or technology. Uh, we don't even demand that they speak English. We can't go on like this. What do we talk? We talk about, in, in the same breath, artificial intelligence. I think we exaggerate it right now, but it's very clear that AI is going to change things. And a lot of these people that we're bringing in, how are we going to employ them? And no one steps forward and says, well, what about Americans? Shouldn't we be thinking about Americans first? And if you bring that up, the news media crushes you. What do you mean America first? Well, if we're not going to be Americans first and worry about Americans first, then why do we have a country at all? And I think that's the real question. Can we actually keep the country we've got at all? It's going to be tough. Well, a lot of people have really lost faith in their in their representatives. Do you think that the people leading this country are malicious or misinformed or a combination. It's time for another quick break to hear these messages from my partners. Next up, I wanna share with you about CrowdHealth, which is a Bitcoin alternative to health insurance. Health insurance costs are sky high today and you send your money every month to a massive corporation and then you never see that money again, even if you don't need a doctor. But if you do need care, you end up having to pay even more out of pocket, especially if you end up as one of the 20% of claims on average that aren't covered. CrowdHealth is all about community and the community crowdfunds everyone's health care. So if something happens to you and you need medical care, CrowdHealth negotiates down the medical bill lower than what insurance would be, and then the community helps you cover it. And in turn, you help cover others' needs, which has been so rewarding. I am so glad I switched to this program. And for more information, you can head to joincrowdhealth.com slash Natalie and use promo code Natalie for a discount. I am so excited to share that I have joined Orange Pill app as an advisor. If you haven't downloaded this app yet, you are missing out on connecting with Bitcoiners in your area. The Orange Pill app is building the social layer for Bitcoin and helping to create opportunities for in-person connections and community building. You can create a profile and you will see lots of familiar faces there. And then you can search for Bitcoiners or Bitcoin events based on your location. I am geotagged in my home base, St. Louis, and I'm super grateful because the Orange Pill app has helped connect me with Bitcoiners in my new city. So come join us, download the Orange Pill app and head to theorangepillapp.com for more information. All right, back to the show. Do you think that the people leading this country are malicious or misinformed or a combination? 
I think it's a combination. I think some of them are just corrupt. It's very, very hard for people that come to Washington, which is a place where we didn't intend to turn out large numbers of millionaires, but we do. If you're willing to sign on to bad policies, if you're willing to support bad programs, whether they're military or otherwise, there's lots of money in it for you. I, I would argue that we no longer have anything remotely like a republic or democracy. What, what we've got right now, I think, is a donor dominated government. The donors are determining that we should be fighting Russia in Eastern Ukraine. That's ridiculous. I don't think any American would vote for it if he understood anything about it. Well, it's easy when you can just print the money, right? I mean, what's your reaction to all the money that we've been sending to Ukraine just recently? Apparently, there was like $6.2 billion in an accounting error. I mean, what does this actually mean for the American people? Because, you know, sometimes it's out of sight, out of mind. I think some people are following this war very closely. Others feel very disconnected or they might put a Ukraine flag on their, you know, Facebook profile. But what does this war actually mean? Why should Westerners care what's happening? Well, the vast majority of Americans don't care. They're not interested. They're busy elsewhere. I remember when Newt Gingrich led this congressional revolt against uh, Bill Clinton, and he effectively shut down the government. And the Republicans at the time mistakenly thought, oh, this is going to work to our advantage. It really didn't. And I remember they, they interviewed a gentleman who was on his bicycle with a case of beer strapped to the back in San Francisco. And they said, sir, sir. Uh, would you talk to us? And he said, sure, what? He said, well, you know, what do you think about this government shutdown? Well, you know, uh, as long as I can get my beer and I can go back and watch, uh, you know, TV and uh, do what I need to do, I guess it doesn't matter much. That's the problem. There are too many people that feel unaffected. You still have this problem in many areas. Just because illegals haven't broken into your house and taken, taken control of it, or they haven't pitched a tent on your lawn, well, you know, it doesn't really affect me. This is the problem with a very large country like the United States. It can't go on, though, Natalie. Uh, people have got to wake up. And I, I really think they'll wake up when the economy tanks completely and the financial system breaks down. I think they'll pay more attention when the banks say, I'm sorry, we're shutting down for two weeks. Mm -hmm. How much, how long will it take before that happens? Well, you said earlier, one of the things we have to do immediately is cut our spending because we keep spending money that we don't have. We keep going further and further into debt. So if you were leading this country and you had executive powers, what would you do? Well, the first thing that you have to do is close that border. And I would take all the forces that we have sitting in Romania and uh, Poland right now and repatriate them to the United States immediately. I'd bring the forces back from Korea. There are no imminent dangers to us overseas. And the countries that we have been subsidizing for decades are eminently capable of defending themselves. That's what President Trump said. He's right. And I would tell our allies for the moment, you need to be your own first responder. Don't depend on us to travel six to 10,000 miles because right now, given new technology, we can't get there anyway. Uh, if we were fighting the Russians or the Chinese or something, they'd interdict it. So we can't behave as we did 40, 50, 60 years ago. So I'd bring them home. I'd close that border right away. And then I'd say the next thing we're going to do is restore the rule of law. And the first step is to tell all the people that are in the United States illegally, you've got 60 days to get out. And if you uh, register with us on the way out and you're honest, uh, we'll consider you for admission at a later date. But right now, you've got to go home and get out of here. If you stay beyond the 60-day period, well, you could face incarceration or worse. And then I would begin looking at these big cities. You know, I think we'll probably end up in some kind of conflict with the drug cartels simply because they've penetrated our police departments, our governments. They've penetrated all over the United States. So if we're going to stop that fentanyl craze, along with a lot of other problems, and the human trafficking, which is way out of control right now, it's going to take uh, harsh measures. Those things are going to tie us up for years because we'll never get back to the kind of civil society and effective society and good economy unless we do those things. This is such a polarizing issue. I mean, what do you say to people out there who look at this solely from the humanitarian 
uh, viewpoint saying that these people are facing crises and danger. They're trying to come to a same place and, and work. So wh what do you say to that? Do you just have an issue with the fact that there should be this legal process that people have to wait in line and 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 show you know who they are um, in order to be able to come here to try to work? First of all, tolerating the intolerable, which is what we're we're doing and have been doing for a while, is the path to total destruction. Our civilization can't survive it. So if we're not willing to defend ourselves, our values, our society, our people, if we're not willing to do those things, we will not survive. So that's the first part. Second part is we should be interested in limited immigration. We should be looking at people with exceptional skills. We used to have an Exceptional Skills Act in the United States. We didn't allow for general uh, immigration after 1924, but we recognized that there were people out there with exceptional skills. They needed to be admitted. That's how we got Albert Einstein. That's how Werner von Braun showed up with his technicians. Even though people complained about it without him, we'd never had any intercontinental ballistic missiles. We would have fallen far behind the Soviets. So you need exceptional people. And we can be selective. We say, listen, if you don't already speak English, we're past the point now. You know, there are more people who speak English in China than there are in the United States. So there's no reason why someone who wants to come here can't learn to speak English. We're under no obligation to take in other people's miseries and problems or make their world, their fights, their conflicts, their wars ours. The whole purpose of trying the United States was to get out of that. We need to get back to it. Yeah, you know, I find that really interesting um, just because when I immigrated to the U.S. when I was five years old, my family brought me here. They were trying to escape communism and in Eastern Europe, they wanted to come here for the sense of the American dream, the ability to work for upward social mobility. And my parents didn't want me to speak Polish. They wanted me to speak English. Um, they were proud that I was going to get to learn English. And I have seen that shift a little bit. And I don't, you know, I, I almost wish that I had more of, of my Polish speaking skills, but it was, again, it was that pride that we are here. We are American. And now, especially if you live in certain parts of the country, you might not find someone who actually speaks English. Well, look, you, you make an important point. When I was growing up as a child, I was fascinated, particularly about Eastern Europe. It's one of the reasons I ended up going to Germany as an exchange student. I went to Brunswick and somebody asked me, why'd you go there? It was as far east as I could get uh, at the time. And that was 1969. But I, I was interested in, in the very things that you're, you're talking about. I wanted to learn some Ukrainian and Polish. I wanted to learn about these people, the Lithuanians, the rest of them. And you're right. Uh, they, the, the children I was, growing, I was growing up with, most of them couldn't speak it, didn't understand it, thought it was rather odd. And their parents were amazed that this uh, Quaker from North Philadelphia was interested in them and what they thought and their culture. But I'll tell you something else. Uh, in the 1960s, a lot of those young boys that grew up, they went to their fathers and they said, look, I think this Vietnam War is terrible. I'm going to go to Canada. And I remember one of them came out to play. His name was, we called him Stosh. So I guess his real name was Stanislaw. But uh, he came out, he had a black eye. Mm -hmm. And we said, Stosh, what happened? He said, well, I told my old man I wasn't going to fight. And he said, America is the greatest country in the world, and you will fight communism, and you will defend this country. These people were the best American citizens I've ever seen. And you're right. We've lost that. We need to get it back. Well, it's just interesting to see how everyone's dividing themselves into teams. And I no longer even understand what makes a liberal, what makes a Republican, because um, in the past, the very people who would defend freedom of speech and were skeptical of the FBI seem to be um, acting in, as if it's the opposite now. And I, I I think that for the average person, even though we're portrayed these extremes in, in media and certainly online through the algorithms, I do believe that most people are good. They want to work hard and take care of their families. I mean, what gives you hope that the common person, the working person can win in a world of so much turmoil? Well, it's funny you bring up Republicans and Democrats because I fail to see a great deal of difference between most of them anymore. I talk about the Uniparty, and I'm an advocate for a third party. Uh, I think the two institutions have outlived their utility. Uh, we need someone to lead that effort. I was hoping that President Trump would. He hasn't. Uh, we need a different party, a party that is American, a party that is unambiguously nationalist and conservative. 
that believes in the country that you and I are talking about. I think that there's no shortage of Americans who would join that, many of whom call themselves Democrats, some of whom call themselves Republicans. I think that's needed. But I don't have an easy answer. Uh, I think, though, that hard times produce strong people. Easy times don't produce much of anything. We've had too many easy times for too long, and we haven't produced much. All you have to do is look at the American military. When I go back to my childhood and remember the people that I grew up with who had fought in Korea, the Second World War, and I look at the people that we have running the show today, I, I'm disgusted. Those people were inspirations. These people are depressing. They're so busy trying to get promoted to get into a position in retirement where they can enrich themselves. They've, they've forgotten the country completely. They're, this sense of service must return. It's it's not there at the moment. I agree with you. Well, where I want to close this out is what's that saying that we're um, it's a path diverged in the woods. We can go in two different directions. If we make the right decisions, what will America look like, say, 10 years from now? If we make the wrong decisions or keep going down the path we have been going on, what does America look like in 10 years? Well, if we go the wrong way, which is the way we are headed right now, I don't think the United States will be a great power any longer. Whether or not we hold together as a unitary state is another question. I'm someone who believes fiercely in defending every inch of soil that is American. I oppose any breakup under any circumstances. But to ensure that doesn't happen, we have to reaffirm our national identity. We have been destroying it. We need to get out of this business of defaming everything that was us. We need to identify strongly with what we have been in the past if we're going to have a future at all. Stop apologizing on the basis of ridiculous assertions made by people who are effectively not Americans. If they are, then they certainly hate the country. Why listen to them? We haven't got time for that nonsense. What gives you hope? Looking at you and people like you, because there are lots of people your age who have a lot of common sense and ability. I think there are more out there than we think. And I think we need more youth and less old men, even though that includes me, obviously. And people that, are, that have courage are willing to stand up and say, I don't care what you call me. Call me whatever you want. Get the hell out of my way. I'm an American. I'm going to do what I think is right for my country. That's essentially what we've got to have. And I, I think they're there. Well, thank you so much. That's very, very kind of you, Colonel McGregor. It's always an honor to speak with you. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us. And uh, we hope to talk to you again soon. Sure. Long live Bitcoin. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching the video version of this show. I really want to hear from you. If you have suggestions or guest recommendations, you can email me at natalie at talkingbitcoin.com. Please subscribe if you want more content and I'll see you next time.